Well, good morning and welcome to Bible Center. I'm Mike. Um, on my way up, John looked at me and said, no pressure, but this is my favorite passage, so don't mess it up. So thanks. It's a great way to start the morning. So no pressure. Um, this series is a series called Follow. And we're going to be in this series for most of the fall. And it's a really fun series because this concept of follow is Jesus is taking us from one place and he's going to change and transform us into something else. But we start with following Jesus. And if we follow him, we go through this process of transformation. In fact, we're asking Jesus to take us through a year of transformation. And as we follow Jesus, Jesus describes himself to us this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it kind of breaks us up into a couple mini-series. So part of this mini-series is that Jesus is the way. And our desire is to love who Jesus loves. And today in Matthew chapter 9, we're going to see the scope of the love of Jesus. And we're going to see it through the story of Matthew following Jesus. And it should challenge us. But before we jump into Matthew chapter 9, John's favorite passage, uh, I'd like you to do a favor for me. When you came in, you got this two-question survey, and it talks about habits. Habits are the way that we grow, the way that Jesus transforms us, and we would like to know how we're doing as a church, how you're doing. You're going to notice on this, and hopefully you have a pen with you, there's a spot for your name. You don't have to fill your name in, but I would like you to take a moment with me. We're going to do this together, and then the ushers are going to collect these. I want you to answer these two questions. The first question is this. Circle. It's an instruction, not a question. Circle the habits in which you are actively growing. There are six habits. The first one is have a group. If you are presently in a place where you're with people that know how you're doing spiritually, and you know how they're doing spiritually, circle H. Attend regularly is the second letter. If you come on Sunday mornings or come to church two or more times a month, circle A. The third one is B for B in the Bible. If you are in the Bible three to four times a week or more, I would love for you to circle the B. I is invest faithfully. It's a challenge for us to use our time, our talents, and our treasures to serve God. So if you're in a place in your life where you're serving in some capacity and you're giving in some way financially, I'd love for you to circle I. T is talk to God. If prayer is a part of your life with consistency, circle T. And the last one is S, which is share your faith. If in the last two months you've had a spiritual conversation or had someone in your house who doesn't know Christ, or maybe you've invited them here to church, I would love for you to circle S. So go ahead and circle those. If you don't have a pen, I'm sure someone around you does. We're going to collect those here in a moment. Uh, the second one is which of these habits represent your next step of growth? One of the big themes for the whole year is that everyone is called to grow spiritually and we want everyone to take their next step of spiritual growth. So for you, looking at those habits, which one for you is maybe your next step of spiritual growth? For me, I'm going to circle the S. It's something I feel like I need to grow in. I used to be a personal trainer full-time and pastor part-time. And since I've switched, I'm a pastor full-time. It takes a little bit more effort to meet people that don't know Jesus. I'm in the church all the time. So S is kind of my growing edge. So as the ushers come forward with some baskets... And you finalize that. If you could just pass it to your right, pass it to your right. The ushers are going to come forward, and they're going to collect those from you, if you don't mind. What this does is it allows us to know things we should emphasize from up here. It allows us to kind of fashion sermon series and create opportunities. And out here, at the end of every service, we're going to have a next step team. And that next, te next step team will help you grow in the habit you want to grow in. So thank you for taking a moment to do that survey with us. We'll probably do that once or twice a year. So if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 9. And again, this is the story of Matthew following Jesus. In verse 9, it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And Matthew got up and followed Jesus. Pretty simple verse, but there's a lot going on here. First thing I'd like to do is introduce you to Matthew. So Matthew's a tax collector. And if you've been in church for a while, you've probably heard that tax collectors weren't liked. But I'd like to make sure you understand the full scope of what that means. From a religious point of view, a tax collector was considered unclean. 
a religious leader would not go into the home of a tax collector. They likely wouldn't interact with a tax collector. They were not welcome to come into the temple. They were unclean. If you could imagine the United States being taken over by an enemy country, and then someone you know now works for that enemy country to take your money from you, you would assume that person is now sided with the enemy. That's what tax collectors were to the Jewish people. They were aligned with Rome. They worked for Rome. They collected money from the Jewish people and gave it to Rome. They were now part of the enemy, so they were hated. And oftentimes, a tax collector would take a little extra and line their pockets, so they were considered extortionists as well. Hated, unclean extortionists. The everyday tax collector during this period of time. As we read this verse, there's a parallel passage in Luke chapter 5 that we're going to see kind of back and forth. But as Jesus comes up to Matthew, he simply looks at him and says, follow me. And in that moment, it says Matthew got up and followed him. In Luke chapter 5, which is a parallel passage, it adds that he left everything and followed Jesus. Oftentimes when we choose to follow Jesus... We're going to have to leave something behind. Two weeks ago, John was up here with a net. And he was talking about these fishermen who had to leave the net behind, leave their lifestyle behind to then follow Jesus. Matthew had to leave something behind. Matthew was literally sitting in the tax office, likely in Capernaum. And as goods would pass by on the road that he was sitting beside, he would tax the goods. And he got up from that position, and he walked out to follow Jesus. Peter, Andrew, James, and John could have gone back and started fishing again. But Matthew, when he got up and left, likely his position was filled immediately. There was always someone ready to make a lot more money to fill that position, to start the career as a tax collector. So when Matthew got up and left, there was nothing to go back to. He had to leave something behind to follow Jesus. And you and I, when we're called by Jesus to follow him, sometimes there's things that we need to let go of to follow Jesus. There's things that we might need to leave behind. Sometimes it's a, it's a relationship that needs to be left behind. Maybe it's a, a habit or an addiction or maybe even a hobby. Anything that would stop you from following Jesus, you have to consider letting go of so that you can say yes to Jesus. And throughout our life, we find that there's more and more things we have to sometimes let go of so we can follow Jesus. I grew up in Canton, Ohio. Sundays are kind of a big day. They're also a big day here. So are Saturdays when certain football teams play. It's easy, even for me sometimes, to get more involved with that than things I should be focused on. I'm not saying football's bad, but just as you look at your life, you ever have things in your life or people in your life or things in your schedule that stop you from really following Jesus? Whatever that thing is might be a thing that you need to let go of. So sometimes you have to let go of something to start this journey. And as you say yes to following Jesus, I just want you to know that you have no idea where this journey is going to take you. Oftentimes, it takes you places that you wouldn't expect. This summer, I had the opportunity to hike with some friends in Colorado, and I have a map of one of the hikes. So if you look at this, the gray line in the background, this is off of my fitness app, the gray line is the actual path I was supposed to hike. And that day, they they let me lead the group. This is a 13,000-foot mountain which is actually a little scary, and the gray line represents just kind of walking along the ridge, not too bad. Somehow I took a wrong turn, and that actually represents being on like rocks, on crevices, on the side of the mountain, climbing things, and I wasn't allowed to lead again for the rest of the week. But sometimes you think the path is going to go one way, and it takes you in places you would have never expected. So when Matthew said yes to Jesus... He probably knew who Jesus was. He's probably heard of Jesus. In fact, Jesus was a bit of a local celebrity. So maybe Matthew thought this would be an upgrade. He didn't know that he would likely be hated like Jesus was hated. He'd probably spend some nights sleeping on the ground. 
Now, he got to see some miracles, the feeding of thousands of people. He got to see healings. Like, Jesus did amazing things. He got to walk through life with Jesus himself. Then he also got to see Jesus betrayed. He actually saw Jesus hang on a cross and die. These were things that Matthew would not have expected when he said yes to following Jesus. Sometimes when you and I say yes to following Jesus, your life might look more like the red line than the gray line, a life you would not have expected. <clears throat> but as you say yes to Jesus, it's good to remember that you're following a person, not a path. Jesus looked at Matthew and said, follow me. And then it says, Matthew got up, left everything, and followed him. Him. You follow a person. You don't follow a plan. We don't follow a path. You and I aren't following a set of rules. We're following a person. Not just a set of beliefs. Not just a family tradition. We're not following a religion. We're following a person who knows you, who loves you, who will take care of you, who will link arm in arm with you along this journey. You and I aren't following simply a religion. We're following a person. We began a relationship. We follow Jesus. So when we say yes to Jesus, we have to get up and we go and we follow him with all of our heart. The path will be unexpected. But along the way, one of the things that we see happening with Matthew is that we're called to bring our friends along. We bring our friends. In verse 10 it says, while he, Jesus, was reclining at the table in the house, and this is Matthew's table in Matthew's house, it says, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. So after Matthew says yes to following Jesus, you fast forward to the evening in verse 10, and there's a table. And around this table is Jesus and his disciples and tax collectors and sinners. So it's interesting to note here that Jesus doesn't take us away from our friends. Rather, we're called to take our friends to Jesus. That's what we see happening here in the life of Matthew. Jesus doesn't say, you hang out with bad people. Don't hang out with them. You're only allowed to hang out with me. Rather, he says, why don't you bring your friends to meet me? The other Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, identifies this as Matthew's house. It identifies this as a celebration, as a banquet And because we're following a person, we're not following a religion, we're not just following a set of rules, when we follow Jesus, we have the opportunity then to introduce our family and our friends to a person. We get to have conversations that sound like this. I want you to meet Jesus. Jesus changed me. I live differently now because of him. This Bible, this book are his words to me and because of his words to me and my relationship with him, I parent a little bit differently. My friendships look different. My marriage has completely changed because of my relationship with Jesus. I'm following him and he is changing me. In my hardest moments, I find that he is there. In my best moments, I find that he is there. He's radically changed the way I view my life and my world and the things that I care about. I would like you to meet a person. I would like you to meet Jesus, my closest friend. So as you follow Jesus, he puts you in a position because you're following a person for you then to introduce other people to following him as well to knowing him. You're introducing them to a person. He doesn't take us away from our friends. We take our friends to Jesus. Matthew was a living testimony of the power and the person and the work of Jesus. You would think in this moment, Matthew would be thinking things like this. Did I just walk off from my job? Where's the money going to come from? I have this nice house, but how am I going to keep this nice house? There should be maybe some stress, some anxiety, some despair, but that's not what we see. Rather, we see a celebration, a bringing of people together. He's excited about this change in his life. He's looking 
forward to what Jesus is going to do. So we bring our friends to Jesus. I think sometimes, because of the, and this is a good thing, but because of Billy Graham and big events and revivals, I think many of us think that people come to know Christ typically through events. And sometimes they do. Just last week, we saw several people come to know Christ in this service. A beautiful thing. But as studies are done on people who come to know Christ and follow Jesus over time, over 90% of people that make a decision to follow Jesus do so because of relationships and conversations with their family and their friends. 90% of people who make a decision to follow Jesus and to walk with Jesus make that decision because of their relationships and their conversations with their family and their friends. There's a good number of people here this morning. You have family and friends who aren't here. You have family and friends who don't know Jesus. And the best shot that they have of knowing Jesus is often by you having a deep relationship with them and you inviting them to your table, spending time with them, talking to them about how Jesus has changed you in a kind and compassionate way, and they get to hear about him. Most people come to know Christ through those types of conversations. Jesus loves your family and your friends even more than you do. So even today, if, we, if I invite you over to dinner, that means I want to get to know you. It's kind of a big deal. Back then, it was even a bigger deal to invite someone into your home. Back then, if you went to someone's home and had dinner with them, you were basically saying, I have a close association with this person. It assumed friendship. It often defined one's peer group and your social status. Like spending time with someone in their home, eating a meal was a big, big deal. And the word here is the word they reclined at the table. Even the word recline there means that this would have been a big deal, a banquet, a large party. Matthew wasn't doing this little, Matthew was doing this up big. This was a big deal in Matthew's home. In Luke chapter 5, verse 29, it says that Matthew held a great banquet for Jesus in his house. Great banquet. So Jesus responds this way to the invitation. Jesus shows up, walks through the door. He also reclines at the table and just simply spends time with them. I think for some of us, there's a part of us that thinks that Jesus should show up with a room of tax collectors and sinners, should show up, bring a lecture board, bring a pointy finger and say, you need to stop living like this. I came to tell you the difference between right and wrong because you can't seem to figure it out. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't show up to lecture. Jesus shows up to say, I'm going to align myself with you. I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to recline at this table with you. I'm going to associate myself with you. In the New Living Translation, this group of folks that have collected around the table are called tax collectors and reputable sinners. In the New Living Translation, when the Pharisees show up, the Pharisees call this group of people scum. They would have been the most notorious sinners of the day. And by eating with them, Jesus is indicating, perhaps even declaring, these these are my people. These are who I'm going to spend time with. When I have extra time, this is where I'm going to go. This is a love that would have surprised everyone who is watching, probably even the disciples. So what Jesus is doing here is he's setting an example for us. The Pharisees and religious leaders would not even go into a house like this. The interaction that these Gentiles, that these tax collectors has with Gentiles would have made them unclean. The Pharisees would have not spent any time with them, would not have invited them into the temple or gone into their homes. But Jesus does this. Jesus goes into the house and says, and he took his disciples. So Jesus didn't say, I'm going to go in. This is a tough environment. I don't want you to be tempted. You stay outside and I'm going to go in. He didn't do that. 
He went in and he took his disciples and said, this is what we do. This is how we're going to live. This is how we're going to start doing things. And he sets the example and they all go in and they all sit at the table, Jesus and the disciples, and they spend time with this notorious crowd. He sets a new standard. He sets a new expectation. He gave them something to now live by. He gave them something that we also should now live by. Jesus just saw this situation differently than sometimes you and I do. He saw the situation differently than the Pharisees and religious leaders would see. Oftentimes, we put people in the categories of good or bad. Good or bad. Jesus saw it this way. Either they know me or they don't know me. And if they know me, I didn't come for them. I came for those who don't know me. How are people going to meet Jesus if they don't spend time with Jesus? How are people now going to meet Jesus if they don't spend time with you? How will we introduce people to Jesus if we're not spending time with the people who desperately need Jesus? So when it comes to the way we live our life, when you look at your schedule, when you look at your relationships, when you look at your friendships, who have you surrounded yourself with? There's an interesting study. I'm reading a bunch of books right now, studying stuff on how churches grow. And it says that churches where the average attender has six relationships with people that don't know Jesus, six, that church is probably declining. If the average attender in a church has nine relationships with people that don't know Jesus, is probably maintaining the same number of people. If the average attender has 12 people in their life that don't know Jesus, that church is probably growing and thriving. We are salt and light. We're called to be with people that don't know Jesus. They will not know Jesus if we're not with them. We're called to be that for people. And Jesus sets the expectation. We live a life with people who do and do not know Jesus. And for those who don't know Jesus, we introduce these people to a person. We introduce our friends to Jesus. So, Jesus challenges Matthew to follow. Matthew gets up, he leaves some stuff behind, and he goes on this journey. This journey that will have things that he won't expect. Jesus then calls Matthew to bring his friends to the table, and there's a banquet, and Jesus hangs out with them. Now, some folks begin to crash the party. In verse 11, it says... When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, when he heard this, Jesus could hear the conversation. So when Jesus hears the conversation, Jesus enters in. He goes into the conversation and says, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. And in verse 13, he says, go and learn what this means. And the idea of go and learn is take your time, sit down, meditate, and process on these words. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So there's some big thoughts here. A little bit of a paradigm shift that the Pharisees had to go through, and perhaps we need to go through. Number one is people are not the problem. When Jesus was in that environment, when Jesus was sitting at the table, he's declaring people are not the problem. The Pharisees are looking at this people, these notorious sinners, these tax collectors, and they're saying, they're all bad. They're the problem. Stay away from those people. We will not enter that house. They cannot come into the temple. They are the problem. They are bad. And the religious leaders, they believe they've earned favor from God. We've done all the right things. We've sacrificed to live a certain way. Not only have we lived by the letter of the law, we've made up some additional laws, and we're living by them too. We're the ones that have earned a seat at the table. We deserve time with Jesus. We've earned favor with God. We are good. They are bad. They viewed these people as notorious sinners and judged Jesus as scandalous for spending time with them. But this is not how Jesus viewed people. 
This is not how Jesus treated people. Instead of declaring that people are the problem, Jesus declared sin is the problem. He did that in these words. When he heard this, he said, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. A doctor cares for the patient. When a doctor walks into a doctor's office and sees sick people in his office, he doesn't say, who do you think you are? Why are you in my office? And kick them out. What does the doctor do? He treats the sickness so that the people are taken care of. He looks at the person and says, you are sick. What can I do to make you well? The doctor fights the sickness. He doesn't fight the person. He loves the person and fixes the sickness to make them well. Sometimes we look at the people around us and we expect them to think a certain way. We expect people to believe a certain way. We expect people to live a certain way. We expect people who don't know Jesus to act like they know Jesus. We expect people who are sick to act like they are healthy when they simply can't do that. They don't know Jesus. They can't be well because they are sick and they're sinners and they're lost. They need Jesus. They can't act like him when they don't know him. We may even distance ourselves from particular types of people. Jesus said... I came for the sick. He then suffered for the sick. He then died for the sick. But our tendency sometimes is to separate ourselves from people who don't live the way they're supposed to, don't say the things that they're supposed to say. They don't act the way they're supposed to act, and we create a barrier between us and them. It's important for us to realize that Jesus loves the person that you and I avoid. Jesus loves the person who makes you feel uncomfortable. Jesus loves the person who disagrees with you. Jesus loves the person who votes differently than you. Jesus loves the person who makes you angry. Jesus loves the person who hurts you. Jesus loves the person who you won't associate with. Jesus loves your enemies. Jesus loves the person that you and I hate. He loves them so much that he'll sit at a table with them. He'll suffer for them. He will die for them. The person in your mind that you're like, I will not associate with that person, Jesus sits beside them and reclines with them so that they might know him. Jesus' love is surprising, overwhelming in scope. He says people are not the problem. Sin is the problem. And Jesus came to save people from their sin. People are not the problem. Sin is the problem. And Jesus came to save people from their sin. So people are not the problem. Sin is the problem. But if you look at the Pharisees when they show up, they're blinded. They think the biggest problem is other people's sin. What we learn from this is that we should assume our sin is the biggest problem. The Pharisees had become blind and they didn't even know it. They viewed themselves as having it all together. They deserved Jesus' attention, not these people. They believed that their good deeds earned them a seat at the table. They thought it was all about cleaning up the outside. We have sacrificed to live this way. We've given up so much to live like this. We deserve time with you, Jesus. We deserve your attention. Why are you with them? You should be hanging out with us. Do you not see how much we've done? The work of our hands? Jesus is not impressed with their sacrifice. Actually, Jesus is concerned about their lack of mercy, kindness, patience, compassion, and love. Jesus' criticism lands not on the tax collectors, and the sinners, his criticism lands on the religious for the state of their heart. They were so concerned with the sickness of others that they did not rightly diagnose their own case of self-righteousness and pride. They had blinders on. They thought, they're all bad, we're all good. 
instead of rightly judging their own hearts. So Jesus pokes them a bit. He says it's not for the well who need a doctor that he came. He came for the sick. And he's basically looking at them and saying, if you don't understand that you're sick, I didn't come for you. If you don't get that you need me, I'm not coming to you. The sin that we need to focus on is your sin and my sin. In verse 13, at the end of this passage, Jesus looks at them and and he, he looks at the Pharisees. He says, go and learn. And again, this means go take some time, process, meditate, think on this. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He desires mercy. They've said we've sacrificed so much. And he says, that's not what it's about. I desire mercy. And in that moment, he's quoting Hosea 6.6. And that word mercy there, in the Hebrew is the word hesed. And that word, as you get to know it, is one of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. It's the merciful, patient love of God. We need God's hesed. It's where he patiently, mercifully loves his people in an enduring fashion. So what he's saying is, what I need from you is that you will love people in a patient, steadfast kind of way, much like you've been loved. The mercy you've been shown, you should show to others. You've received mercy, give mercy. He's reminding them that you, we, are the sick, the sinners, and the lost. And Jesus came and reclined at the table with you and with me. Therefore, who are we to ever to refuse a seat at our table for someone else? We shouldn't have had a seat at the table, but we were given one. We were shown mercy. So when it comes to the seat at your table, there should always be an open seat for anyone, and they should be invited to join because even if they're the sick and the hurt and the broken and the sinful and they're acting like they don't know Jesus, they're the ones that need to meet Jesus. Jesus came for them. That seat is for our friends is for our family, is for our neighbors, is for the hard people, is for the people we can't stand. That seat at your table is even for the person you hate because Jesus loves the person that you hate. Jesus' love is surprising in scope. It blew the Pharisees' mind to see Jesus with these people. It should blow our mind in the way we love and take care of other people. The way we live our life, the way we prioritize people, even people that you would think that we shouldn't prioritize, it will cause the world to look at you and see Jesus. Our love should be surprising in scope. When it comes to Matthew, we met Matthew a little bit ago. It's Matthew's house, it's Matthew's friends. The notorious sinners are the crowd that Matthew hung out with. And Matthew got to experience this surprising, overwhelming love of Jesus. And it changed him. He followed Jesus, and Jesus transformed Matthew. Now, there's some disagreement to exactly what happened to Matthew, where he ministered, and how he lost his life. But one strain of thought, some of the historians believe that Matthew ended his life doing ministry to barbarians outside of the Roman Empire. Back in that day, they were in the Roman Empire, and there were folks that lived outside that were considered uncivilized. This particular group were considered barbarians, and they're also cannibals. And Matthew ended his life ministering to these people who would have been considered more animal than human. So we look at him with tax collectors and sinners, and we think, how could it get worse? Jesus then sends Matthew to go to people who are considered animals who are barbarians, who eat people. And that's where Matthew loses his life. Those are the people that he put around his table at the end of his life. So Matthew was radically changed by the scope and power of the love of Jesus. You and I don't deserve the love of Jesus, yet he let us sit at his table. 
We got to meet Jesus and follow Jesus. That offer stands before you today to follow him. And if you follow him, he will change you and transform you. This picture of his love, the scope of his love, should be something that you and I begin to embody in the way we live. The person that we can't stand, the person that has hurt us, the person that we don't want to associate with, the person that we distance ourselves from, the person that we consider unclean is perhaps the person that we should sit at our table and introduce to our best friend, Jesus, because people won't act like Jesus until they know Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and ask that you would choose to continue to reveal and show your incredible love to us in a way that is surprising and that blows our minds. And I pray that in this journey of following you, that we see you for who you are and see the people that you love and we would join you at the table. That we, your disciples, would walk into the same doorways that you walk into. And we would sit with the same people that you sit with. Not to lecture them, not to point a finger, but to love them and introduce them to you. We ask this in your name. Amen.